Ahoy there folks, I'm Captain Benzi and welcome to another patch notes video for Eve Echoes. At long last, we have the patch notes for the April 2022 patch. This is the big balance adjustment that we've been looking forward to for well over a year now. This was originally supposed to happen sometime between August and October last year, but it got pushed back due to the inclusion of capital ships. They were prioritized, the balance patch was put on a back burner, um, and well, you know what, I can sit here and complain about that and talk about that until the cows come home, but it's here. I think it's important now that we just look at the fact that it is here, we look at this for what it is, and we talk about what this means going forward, because there's a lot of really cool stuff here. Now, this is going to be a fairly long and verbose video, so treat it kind of like a podcast. Put it on in the background, um, and just let me talk through. I will read through all of the patch notes, and I will give my personal thoughts and opinions on all of this as well. Do strap in, this is going to be a long one, so let's go straight in at the top. Dear Capsuleers, they say, as you all know, there will be a balance patch for Eve Echoes in April. We know that many Capsuleers are very concerned about this adjustment and have given us many valuable suggestions. Thus, we made the balance adjustment after taking feedback, real game data, and development plans into consideration. This balance update covers many aspects of the game, including the yield and distribution of resources, encounters, ships, weapons, and modules. We'll talk about what we plan to modify and why we do so respectively. Respectively. Now, before we continue, it is important to note that there are not many industrial changes in this. When I looked through these notes this morning, I spoke to NetEase and basically said, hang on a second, there's not a lot of industrial change happening here. With all of the stuff that's happening in May, that's disconcerting. That's a little worrying. And I was told, don't worry, the April, uh, sorry, the May update for industry, the one that's adding the raw Carl, the Orca, and the Noctis, will contain some balance patches as well, some changes changes and adjustments to industry, so don't panic that those are not in the notes here. Anyway, so the con contents include yield adjustments on Angel Guristus, etc., interdictor, weapon and ship stats adjustments, shield resistance and armor resistance issues, shield field nerfing, temporary enhancement module issues, including heat sinks, or compression, missile damage, and flight velocity issues, an anti-drone pulse bomb, restrictions on the number of encounters, and combat commendation. Now, I will try and put timestamps for all of those in the description down below, so if there's a particular part you want to jump to, um, yeah, look in the description and see if I've actually managed to put um, timestamps in there for those. Now, they say here we plan to open the test server on April 9th and invite all Capsuleers to experience the new adjustments. We're looking forward to your suggestion and feedback. We'll listen to every Capsuleer and continually improve game design to bring you a better game experience. Please check the community announcement to find out how to join the test server. They'll give more information on that in the future. So let's jump right in, and I've, I'll be honest, we have we were given these this morning, and we gave some feedback to uh, NetEase and basically said, look, this makes sense, this doesn't make sense, and they've given us some actual explanations. We sat down and talked and actually had some idea as to why these changes are happening, and ultimately, that's what this is all going to be about. So we understand many of the problems reported by Capsuleers. This time we will explain why we make these balance adjustments with these common Capsuleers appeals as the title, and that is so so good to see that they are actually explaining why they're making the changes. Not, oh yeah, we just we, we just changed this. First of all, us angels are so poor. Oh boy, don't we know it. There are, of course, similar sayings such as, Gurustus is poorer than angels. Gurustus are lying through their teeth if they say that. I've seen the data. You can look at the statistics. That's utter bullcrud. Um, angel, angel space is the worst. Categorically the worst. It's difficult to clean encounters, and the loot table just really is not very lucrative. They say they noticed the blueprint industry in the Angel Cartel region is not as developed as that in other regions, although the bounty is relatively higher. The profits in Angel Cartel and Gurstus regions are still low because it takes longer to eliminate the pirates. We tried to balance the types of maps and the value of goods, but these ways did little to us, ending, us nearing the end goal. So we finally decided to make a new approach, and what they're doing is making fine adjustments to the factions according to their features whilst maintaining the balance among them, and this is amazing. I am so happy about this, not just because I'm in angel space, I think if you are in any segment of space right now, this is good news for all of us. 
After the adjustment, all factions will have more specific yields and become more different from each other while still being guaranteed similar average values. For example, Angels will have a velocity advantage, while Gurstis will focus on durability and stability. They're looking at what the actual pirate factions do, and the loot is going to be based on that. And that is so cool in regards to rigs, and it means that we're not just going to have, oh, this faction gets navigation rigs, this faction gets engineering rigs, this faction gets these. They're actually splitting the rigs up now. So sorry, Zed God, looks like you're going to have to go through a lot of your old, uh, through your old, um, your document and actually make some changes on this. So let's have a look. Inquisitors and Relics Inquisitor Anomalies and Relic Sites have similar characteristics and the types of blueprint for each region will be adjusted. In addition, we remove the Decomposer blueprint from the Serpentis region and there will be new ways to obtain the blueprints, modules and ships of Decomposers, the Yan Jung stuff. That looks like this is going to be part of the uh, the Scholar Point store. Like we heard that they're moving some of the uh, ships into the Scholar Point store, looks like they're moving the blueprints there as well, which honestly is a good thing. I can only see that as a good thing. First of all, Guristus Space, the Galactic North. Missiles, damage, activation time, flight time, and explosion radius. Drones, now only Guristus Pirates can use drones, and we'll come to that in a moment. Railguns, Karako Rabbit Kosakami is really resourceful. Although he doesn't use railguns, he does have the technology. It kind of makes sense if you're in Kaldari space, those are the ships you're going to be flying. Shield, specifically shield hit points and shield resistance. Navigation, they get cargo hold and warp stability. And engineering, they will have power grid and lock speed. So for engineering, it's worth noting they don't have the, uh, the two capacitor rigs. For navigation, they don't have auxiliary thrusters and polycarbon engine housings or a dynamic fuel valve. Shield, it is just the hit points and the resistance, not the one that boosts faster and things like that. You can see what's going on here. Now, I'll be completely frank and honest up front. This, I hope, changes. The drones, only Guristus pirates can use drones. I do hope this changes. The Serpentis get the drone rigs as well, because that why do, why should Guristus get railguns if Serpentis don't get drones? Because if you're in Serpentis space, you're in Galente space, you should be getting drones. Um, and yeah, ultimately... I hope that does change, as we'll see in a moment. But otherwise, I really like that. Things that, like the fact that the navigation focuses here on warp stability and cargo hold, I think makes a lot of sense. It also helps balance this loot by putting some of the more lucrative ones in fewer areas, and thus, you know, you can spread out the different things. Having to send them via entire blocks like we had before didn't make much sense. Um, it made it easy to know where to go, I guess, but ultimately, for balancing purposes, they've now broken it up. For those of us here in Angel Space, we get missiles, damage, just like Guristus, activation time, just like Guristus, flight velocity, and explosion velocity. So you don't get flight time and explosion radius, we get velocity um, to both of those, which kind of makes sense with Angel Cartel, right? We get all the cannon rigs, shield, three types of shield recharge, that's the one that is reduced capacitor um, usage, faster recharge, and better recharge, so those are nice, we get those, and we get armor rigs. This is really exciting to me, because this actually insinuates that Angel ships and indeed Minmatar ships should and indeed uh, can and indeed should be armor tanked in certain situations. I love that. Navigation, we finally get our auxiliary thrusters back. We're also getting the warp velocity rigs, inertia modifier, particle anchor, so the Higgs anchor, and thruster power consumption. So that's the dynamic fuel valve, um, the auxiliary thrusters, the uh, polycarbon engine housing, Higgs anchor, and the hyperspatial velocity one as well, which is really cool. That's fit it's thematic, and it's nice to see that we will actually have Ox Thrusters. Oh, I'm so happy. Engineering, we get battery. Of course, C-type batteries are gisty, um, so that makes sense. Um, lock speed and scanning strength, again, two advantages that the Angel Cartel there have, so yeah, I'm all for that. Blood Raider, of course, get all laser types. They get all armor rigs. They get warp stability for navigation rigs. They get battery, power grid, lock speed, and anti-scanning, which, of course, are going to be useful there. That makes sense. And the power grid and battery do make sense with it being Blood Raider. And they get the four types of mining rigs. Good. They're all there in Blood Raider. 
Sansha, all lasers, all shields, flight velocity like Angel Space, so Og's thrusters, and uh, dynamic fuel valves are both in Sansha Space, notably not the polycarbon engine housing anymore. Um, capacitor recharge, power grid, and anti-scanning are available, um, and all four types of mining. And then in Serpentis, they get all five railgun, all of the uh, sorry armor hit points and armor resistance rigs, all five structure rigs, navigation, you get the polycarbon engine housing, cargo hold capacity, and warp velocity, and engineering, you get the battery, capacitor recharge, power grid, and scanning. It's nice that they get the majority of the good engineering rigs there. They're the only ones now to get structure rigs, and I know that those are very, you know, not really used. That's going to be a little bit disappointing for some Serpentis folks. They definitely need to have drones in there as well. The more I look at this, the more I just, I, I get confused as to why the railgun ones are in, Gur uh, in Guristus alongside drones, whereas the Serpentis don't get drones. They really need the drone ones in there. That's a big bit of feedback I'll be giving. Make sure you give feedback to that effect as well, if you agree with me, of course. Data sites. Rig integrated module materials used for combat and engineering vary greatly in value. In order to balance the value of the data sites, it's now possible to obtain both combat and engineering integrated materials at all data sites. That is a buff to all forms of exploration. It's not the exploration buff I've been asking for, but it is a buff. And, you know, that's only ever a good thing, right? I'm happy with that. It's I kind of hope we get those changes I've been talking about to exploration further down the line. But a buff is a buff. I'll take it. Capital Cosmic Anomalies, this is your fleet rally points and that. These are different from regular ships. We will make adjustments based on the weapon systems specialized by each faction, the weapon systems of fighters of Capital Cosmic Anomalies. After the adjustment, Gurstis and Blood Raiders will have engineering rigs, capital level, and the other three will have navigation rigs, excluding weapon shields and armor, which will be spread as we saw before. Now, number two then, moving on from the rebalance there of the rig drops. Number two, I use interceptors and I think they're insane. That's not just from me. I know some of you are going to be like, oh, where's Benzie's one? No, no, there are plenty of people who have used that exact sentence um, and it's just flat out true. So interceptor nerfs, they're here. Interceptor frigates can be seen as a combination of assault frigates and interceptor frigates currently, with strong interception and counter-interception capabilities, as well as high firepower. Ultimately, they're only supposed to have that strong interception and counter-interception capability. That's what interceptors are supposed to be, um, not the high firepower. In this patch, the damage and flight velocity of interceptor frigates will decrease, so their assault abilities will be reduced. Assault destroyers are still the strongest nemeses of interceptor frigates. Now, again, this is a point that I sought some clarity on, because I absolutely agree with the damage reduction. These are interceptors, they're not supposed to be, you know, dogfighters, assault frigates, that kind of thing. Reducing their damage, absolutely agree. Adu reducing their flight velocity, this concerns me, because that is a key aspect of what makes an interceptor an interceptor. That said, if you ask me the standard question, do I think that interceptors are too fast? The answer is going to be, yes, I do. I do think they need to be toned down a little bit. As long as this is a minor change, I'm happy with that. You'll notice we don't get numbers. We don't get any numbers here. So as long as this is a minor change, um, then yeah, I agree with it. I personally am of the opinion that the Dramiel and the Daredevil, for example, should be faster than the Slasher Interceptor. They should be. Like in EVE Online, we use the Dramiel and the Daredevil as expensive tackle frigates. Um, it's an advantage of it being a combat frigate. Um, so yeah, I, I don't mind it having reduction to its flight velocity as long as it's minor. Nerfs, people tend to hear the word nerf and then panic. That, oh no, my ship's going to be made useless. No. I think flight velocity here is going to be a minor drop just to help some of the other frigates out a little bit and help the destroyers actually apply their damage to them that touch better. In addition, we've improved the firepower of interdiction destroyers and heavy interdiction cruisers. So those of you who were sad when the heavy interdictors lost half of their high slots, and those of us who had the same with the, uh, the, the, the inter intercept interdictor destroyers, we're getting some of that firepower back. It's not quite, uh, you know, or high, a Thrasher Fleet issue 2 or a Thrasher 3 or whatever it would be at tech level 10. It's not quite that, but at least it's some more firepower on interdiction 
and destroyers to improve their abilities against smaller ships. Of course, their firepower still cannot match the firepower of ships of the same tonnage. So it looks like we're still going to have very much, it's the Talwar 2 Assault alongside a Thrasher 3 Interdictor, and the Thrasher 3 Interdictor is not going to have anywhere near the firepower of the Talwar. Kind of makes sense, but I am still hoping at some point in the future we are going to get the uh, the turret destroyers added as a combat variant at Tech 10. Not necessarily covert ops. People always say, oh, when are we getting the covert ops destroyers back? There's clearly a reason that NetEase removed covert ops destroyers. I don't even necessarily care if they come back with the covert ops tag. Just give me turret destroyers at Tech 10 um, alongside the heck. If it has to be a Thrasher assault, then I'll take it. I'll take a Thrasher Assault. I'd rather it was just a Thrasher 3 or a Thrasher 2 fleet issue sort of thing, um, rather than the Assault bonuses, but I would take it. I just really miss having turret destroyers above tech level 5 that are actually useful in combat. So hopefully that's something we'll see at some point in the future. Not in this patch, but it's coming eventually soon, we hope. As the firepower increases, we also found the interdiction destroyers to be too strong in intercepting. I can understand this one. So if we restricted the continuous intercepting ability of the interdiction sphere. In addition, we've reduced the flight velocity slightly of the two ranged interdictors. The high speed interdiction sphere and warp disruption field are indeed terrifying. So we're getting a slight nerf to the flight velocity of the interdictors, the thrasher interdictor, coercer interdictor, that kind of thing slight nerf to the flight velocity um, and they have an increased cooldown i think they described it as elsewhere on the interdiction spheres this makes sense because one interdictor or two interdictors can just absolutely plaster a gate if you're trained into them you can just plaster an entire gate with bubbles and there's nothing you know no real skill involved in that anymore the heavy interdictors the cruisers you actually have to manually pilot them and get them into a good position um, and follow your target and stuff like that the interdictor destroyers you just kind of drop the bubbles and let them be so having a longer cooldown between bubbles means fewer bubbles which means you just have to think about where you place them a bit better i'm all for that in the meantime, we extended the scramble range on both interdiction sphere launchers and warp disruption field generators, making them easier to operate. So it looks like we're getting a larger bubble from those. Again, I'm all for this. It's like uh, that, that last part, I'm neither here nor there on. I think that reducing the amount of bubbles you have, but making the bubble slightly bigger, it's a good way to give it a little bit of a tweak. Number three then, moving onwards, the shield field is simply unbreachable. Oh Nina, I can hear you from here. It's been commonly seen that both sides use shield field for long range bombardment in shield battle in siege battles. Although the shield field can be countered by drones and assault, anything that can get inside the bubbles of course, it's still a very formidable system as it can absorb all the damage outside of its range. The shield field has generated too much ineffective long range bombardment, making combat boring and slowing its pace, and I'll kind of agree here. I genuinely will agree. You can put up something like a nightmare in the center and then just everything is super safe until uh, that nightmare goes down, which it doesn't ever really. It, uh, it, it makes for a real sort of grind fest um, for PvP. Therefore, the shield field has been called a bug in the game by some players. I wouldn't quite go that far. For one example, one nightmare ship fitted with a large number of advanced resistance modules can withstand the firepower of dozens of battleships with only a little logistic support. True story. And even several dreadnoughts can hardly break its defense. If you don't see that as a problem, I'm not sure what to say. This is really too powerful. Agreed. So we've weakened the resistance of the shield field and it's increased its duration and cooldown. So when you lose the shield field, it takes longer to actually bring it back online. Um, but it looks like they've increased its duration, so it's going to consume fuel slower, but they have weakened its resistances. In order to emphasize the features of positional warfare and reduced fleet losses due to disconnection, warping will be disabled when the shield field and armor link are activated. I wholeheartedly agree with this. I don't know why I never thought of it. I don't know why other people hadn't thought of it. It makes sense. If you're being the Guardian, you should not have the ability to warp away. You're the tank. You are basically planting your banner in the soil and standing fast, death or glory, and I like that. And the speed of guarding ships will be reduced when the shield field is activated. Okay, I don't think the armor links necessary, uh, you know, necessarily need to lose a bit of speed there because the advantage of armor link is that you are brawling with it. Um, but the shield field, yeah, I get that if you put the shield field on, you slow down and you move all of your ship's power into that shield field module instead. Cool. That's why the activation timing will be more important and the two tactics will be more different from each other. Cool. I like that. Something that makes armor and shield field and all that kind of thing different is always a good thing. 
In addition, we made slight adjustments to some logistic ships to make them more distinctive, and slightly increased the support capability of all logistics cruisers. This means that things like the Scythe 2, the Osprey 2, um, and the Augura and Execra. No, no, is that right? Is that right? I can never remember. I'm, I'm getting one of those wrong. Um, the logistics cruisers are going to be improved after this, which is good because there was no real reason to fly them. Why would you fly an Osprey 2 instead of a Hurricane Logistics, for example? Now it looks like there'll be a reason to. Plus, there'll be a bit more of a distinction between the Hurricane, uh, between the Scythe 2 and the Osprey 2, which I'm all for. I like this kind of stuff. Number four, then. Oh, oh no, sorry, before we go on on that one, um, that does also s sort of constitute a nerf for Sansha ships overall. Although, in fairness, with the Shield Field module, when they increased its signature radius bloom to 1000%, um, I think a lot of people stopped using the Shield Field modules on the smaller Sansha ships anyway, and it became just a nightmare thing. Okay, moving on then, number four. Encounters are so easy that they're boring. This is kind of a key point. I think a lot of people get this backwards and they're like, oh, high sec needs to be more lucrative. It takes too long for me to do all this stuff. It's boring. No, it's not that it needs to be more lucrative. It's the fact that it's just, it is just boring. It's not fun to do this kind of stuff. I've talked about this at length before in other videos. In EVE Online, you have three different primary PVE versions. Um, you have the closest thing to our news encounters is agent missions. In agent With agent missions, you dock up at a station, you take a mission from an agent, kind of like quests in other MMOs, you fly out to wherever that mission is, and then you do the thing. Sometimes the thing is warp out here and destroy everyone. Sometimes the thing is warp out here and hold this guy in place with webs until Concord arrives. Sometimes it's, right, we need you to get in there and blow up this installation or search this installation. In one particular case I had this morning, you actually have to basically rescue you guys like blow up some pirates if you feel you need to to rescue some crewmates from one particular ship and then drop them off at a nearby station you don't have to kill the pirates if you don't want to you can just rush in grab the, uh, the crew that you're trying to save and then get to safety but you can also stop and kill the pirates if you want to it's more interesting and then of course there are abyssal dead spaces which are kind of like just you know impromptu encounters, you, in ad hoc encounters, you just decide, okay, I want to create an, a Nihilus dead, uh, a Nihilus, not Nihilus, sorry, an Abyssal dead space. I've got 20 minutes to kill all three rooms before it collapses and I lose my ship. Really, really profitable way of making ISK. It's a nice guaranteed 20 minute thing. And of course, then you have the standard kind of cosmic anomalies as well. You can just jump into one of those, hope that you get an escalation and fly off to a different system and get more of that kind of thing. Ultimately, we just have fly to point A, kill everything, and then you're done. That, that's literally it. Now they say here, encounters, especially encounters in high sec regions, are an easy PvE mode prepared for capsuleers who don't like PvP. Excuse me. The profit of different regions are designed to be high sec is lower than low sec, which is lower than null sec. That's the design intent. At present, though, the profits of encounters in high sec regions are not significantly lower than those of low sec regions due to the refresh mechanism and due to player gathering, PvP influence, and excessive firepower. There are sometimes not enough pirates in null sec, and the profits there are not as good as the profits in high sec and low sec regions. If you've got a lot of people in your alliance, you undock, you can clear all of those belts, uh, all of those anomalies, and you kind of have to wait for something else to spawn in null sec that's a problem in high sec you also have high sec islands where people just grind encounters over and over and over again the really easy ones and make major bank off that and are completely safe while they do so in addition, the comfort of encounters has led to almost all the violators gathering here, which is unfair to the capsuleers and is the most urgent problem that must be solved. Agreed. It will have negative influences on the economy of New Eden before the violators are banned, so prevention measures will be more important. I kind of not sure this whole talk about violators here. I think it's a little bit incendiary, but ultimately I get where they're coming from. If you've got people who can just sit AFK in encounters and people are still botting those, let's not you know, lie on there, there are bots available online that do this for you. Um, ultimately, 
Yeah, it's so easy to just sit there AFK and just grind ISK that that is negatively affecting the economy. That is why Plex prices have gone up. It's not the only reason Plex prices have gone up. The India ban and Russia um, recently as well, without going too political into that, just simple economics. Those are both fairly large whale regions in mobile gaming. A lot of people from those regions do have a large sum of money they tend to drop. This means that there is less Plex actually being added to the game because you've got fewer people able to swipe a credit card um, and get those, which of course means a lower supply of Plex, whilst we still have an ever-increasing demand, plus the fact that Plex prices tend to be um, sort of helpfully tied towards how much the average player can earn, the, the, uh, sorry, how much the top level player can earn. The more ISK a top level player can earn, the higher the value of Plex will become. So if you can reduce the amount that the top player can earn, then you kind of drop the Plex prices down, which helps everyone else below that sort of percentile, which is good news. Now, without affecting Capgelia habits as much as possible, this adjustment is made based on statistics and taking into consideration the health of Capgelias. This is going to be controversial. I've sat down with this and I really, really like this. This is actually a really nice change. It shouldn't affect most people. It affects a tiny percentile of people at the top. Before you get outraged at this, actually stop and consider, does it really affect you? Because if it doesn't affect you personally, this is only going to benefit you by reducing Plex prices and uh, helping out the entire economy. So, first of all, the encounter completion data. They've obtained the following encounter completion data after recording the encounters completed daily by all Capsuleers. Capsuleers who completed more than 61 encounters daily using violation script rate are over 99%. After deducting the violators, the ratio of people actually doing that is only 0.047. So that's botting, I think we're looking at there. So only 0.047 of players go above 61 encounters. Capsuleers who completed 51 to 60, again 99% of them were violation rates. After deducting the violators, the ratio is only 30.31%. Capsuleers who completed 41 to 50 encounters daily, again 99% of those were botters. After deducting violators, the ratio is 0.46%. Add all that together and less than 1% of uh, people um, uh, Capsuleers are completing more than 40 encounters daily. A player needs to be able to complete 25 counters to complete the Concord Pass missions of one week. So that's another key point here, that you only actually need to be able to complete 25 of these, but of course some people are going to want to go above and beyond that, so that's fair enough. Corporation tax rate data. Setting corporation tax rate to 100% is also one of the popular means for violators. Corporation tax rate data long term, about 90% of corporations tax rate is less than to, less than or equal to 10%. 7% um, corpor of corporations have a 10% tax rate um, between 10 and 20%, and about 2% of corporations have a tax rate greater than 20%. The corporations with long term tax rate is of greater than 90% is about 99% bottom rate. Basically, what they're saying here is, if you're seeing people who are doing more than 40 encounters a week, and more than 40 encounters a day, sorry, and in a corporation with 100% tax, um, that is usually a way for, you know, you get a load of bots into one corporation, they go out and they do all these encounters, and 100% of their profits go straight into the corp wallet. Um, it's a way to avoid taxes and all that kind of thing, just get it all into one place really, really easily. So they're saying that is the problem there. Here is the suppo uh, su suggested change. Now for an alpha clone, if the daily encounters accepted is greater than or equal to 40, you can't accept more encounters. So you can do up to 40 encounters a day and then it'll stop you accepting more. Now assuming you've got more in your book, you'll be able to exceed that 40, but you can't accept more um, for that particular day. As an alpha player, again, 25 encounters per week are required for Concord Pass, um, so 40, sh uh, 40 a day should be absolutely fine. For a mega clone, this goes up to 50 encounters. A Macariel battleship is expected to complete 50 encounters with about five and a half hours if fitted with top modules and in good luck. However, it typically takes 10 hours or even longer. Gaming for too long is not healthy for capsuleers and can be very tedious, which is why the restrictions are added. Now, I'll be completely honest, I don't like it when the developer makes a change purely to kind of say, you shouldn't be playing this long. I kind of get where they're coming from, um, but at the same token, I Mm, it, it's one of those I don't really like it, but it's not necessarily a bad thing here either. 
they are right. Um, I've heard a lot of people who do the whole thing of like, oh, I just grind encounters for three hours a day. It's tedious and boring and I hate this game. It's like, well, yeah, if you play it like that, it's going to be tedious and boring. So there is kind of a trying to save you from yourself if you're one of those people. But equally, again, 50 encounters. I can't imagine trying to do 50 encounters daily. That's way more than I have the patience to do. Like, jeez. The solution would also limit the benefits of violators and increase their account costs. Obviously a good thing, reducing their impact on the New Eden economy, but it will indeed affect about 0.817% of earnings of Capture Lears. <laughs> Less than 1%, but hey, hey, I get it, those are real players, I'm laughing just because that is a tiny piece of data, um, but they've set up a combat commendation as a benefit to all capsuleers to ensure, ensure that their earnings are not reduced. Capsuleers can apply for an additional reward to the Concorde for each bounty gained for repelling pilots in the last week. Um, by opening the wallet page, filter bounty rewards, Concorde will, will grant ISK equal to 100% of the bounty as an additional reward to encourage Capsuleers to continue fighting pirates and defending the peace of New Eden. Each bounty can only be claimed once. It'd be better for Capsuleers to destroy pirates as quickly as possible to get better results and claim extra bounties. So basically, you pick a bounty tick and then you can kind of double it which is pretty sweet, I think. It's a good way of reducing just the amount of people sitting AFK in encounters and instead like pushes those bots out and gives, heck, other people a really good way of doing this as well. The higher the tech level, the more times you can apply for combat commendation every week. Unused application opportunities can be stored for four weeks for featured use. Um, please check detailed rules in the in-game wallet interface. I will do a Cat Skull Academy video on this, I'm sure, but the basic concept is that depending on your tech level, you per, uh, per week you get so many combat commendations you can use. You can open up your wallet, pick a bounty tick, and then earn it again. You can earn that bounty tick a second time by spending a combat commendation. You get more of those. Um, the higher tech level you are, and if you have some of these unused, they can carry over. So, for example, imagine you had three of these um, a week at your current level, you don't use any this week, next week you go back in, you've got the three for that week, you've got the three from the previous week, you could double six of your bounties during that week. That's a cool little system, I really like this. Corporation tax rate. Corporations created in less than 30 days cannot set their tax rate at 100%. They can only set up to 20%. Again, I don't see this as being a problem for lower corporate and newer corporations. Um, I know there's that sort of temptation that, you know, we've just opened a corporation. We want to buy um, all of the corporation citadels and stuff like that. So we want to increase the tax rate. 20% tax rate, I think, is absolutely fine. And if again, if it's helping to reduce botting, I am all for it. Finally then, for part four, other adjustments. We've removed the bounty penalty coefficient in Nullsec regions. After the adjustment, you get 100% of the bounty for repelling pirates compared to 95% before the adjustment. So basically, it's just an increase in the bounty that you'll earn in Nullsec. Let's move on then. Number five, will the Scorpion get a buff? Or more generally, what kind of buffs and nerfs are we looking at? And oh, this is so good. This is so good. I'm going to get super excited here. So I really hope you guys don't mind me squealing like a little child. Anyway, we received a lot of complaints from Capsuleers about ships being too weak or something like that. Statistical analysis over a long term has revealed that several ships have yet to achieve our design goals. We've made minor adjustments to some of these chip, uh, ships, such chips changing the chips yeah salt and vinegar to something else anyway um, changing the damage boost from plus five to plus six percent etc you can read more about these small changes in the patch notes of the update we'll go over those in a future video aside from minor adjustments the following vital updates will have been made so we're going to be getting more than just this as well this is aside from the minor adjustments the following vital updates Empire battleships, so and here they clearly mean just combat ships. Blackbird and Celestis. Sensor strength and some other attributes have been substituted, resulting in a marginal increase in their abilities. So no longer is the Blackbird going to be this sort of black sheep of the family for the simple fact that it's got ECM bonuses in a game that doesn't have ECM. They've taken those bonuses away and actually given it something meaningful now. Same with the Celestis. I fly the Celestis a fair amount. I'm excited to get buffs to it. The Blackbird is the only co 
Covert Ops cruiser that I do not fly frequently, now I have an even bigger reason to fly it, especially since you can already oversize the modules, but hey, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Buffs to the Blackbird and Cel uh, Celestis, excellent happy with that. The Rock is getting increased HP so that it matches the general level of other tier 10 ships. Good. The Armageddon gets an, an increase to the number of low slots and enhances its scramble range, so it becomes much more of an E-War vessel, which is pretty cool and a bit more tanky. Scorpion enhanced the missile and turret range to match the general performance of battleships. That's nice as well. Big buffs there to the Scorpion. Typhoon added a mid slot, Tech 9, increased the missile velocity to match the overall performance of battleships. So, again, we're getting a bit more range on the Typhoon, um, which looks like the Typhoon and the Typhoon 2, and the Typhoon at Tech 9 is getting another mid slot. I'm just going to say here as well, I have also pointed out to the developers, I fly the Typhoon 2 a lot. It still confuses me that it is the only Tech 10 battleship that uses basic level skills. You don't need advanced missile, uh, large missile operation. It's just missile operation, you know, large missile operation. Um, that does need to be changed. Um, it's not fair that the Typhoon 2 is the only one that has that. Um, finally, Apocalypse reduced power consumption. This, I, I'm assuming this is a reduction to the uh, amount of com uh, reduced power grid consumption. I'm not sure what that means. I'm assuming that that's a mistranslation of capacitor consumption, in fairness, um, that they're going to have a reduction to the amount of capacitor that gets used. I'll be completely frank, I didn't really think the Apocalypse needed much in the way of uh, any form of buff. Um, considering the Apocalypse Striker is a very good ship as it is, to say the least. But hey, this is a Tech 9 version, looks like it's going to be included in that faction ships. Here it comes. Try not to scream, try not to scream. Dromiel increased damage. Oh. <laughs> Benzie, you mentioned you're working on a Dromiel video. Why haven't you released that video yet? Because I've been waiting for this balance patch to see if the Dromiel got any love, and it is. Oh, I'm so happy about that. I need to move away from the mic because I'm going to scream. <laughs> <laughs> Dromiel gets increased damage, huzzah, Mordu's Legion, all of the Mordu's Legion ships get increased damage and HP, good, I recently got my hands on an Orthrus, thank you so much to the folks who sorted out that donation, I will do a proper shout out in that video once I've got full names and details um, sort of to hand. Um, same with the Sisters of Eve, I had a Stratios built for me as well. Um, but Mordu's Legion increased their damage and HP. That is vital. I'm super happy about that. I'm looking forward to flying those. Sisters of Eve, the Astero, the Stratios, and the Nesta increased their damage, their HP, and analysis success rate. This is key. This is key. Analysis success rate. Not just the ability to scan, but they actually have an improved chance to open up the blasted boxes inside Relic and data sites as well that is super happy we're reducing the uh like the whole random number generator there of exploration if you're in one of those ships as an all-purpose support battleship the nesta's capacitor is hard to support the large remote armor repairs continuous operation uh go the capacitor need of remote armor repairs has been reduced awesome that's good news for nesta pilots Faction battleships, the number of uh, maximum number of targets they can lock on has been increased to match that of Imperial battleships. So that's seven or eight targets I think they go up to now. Capital ships, the Chimera and the Thanatos slightly increased the original feature bonus. Um, this is the bonuses that they have on their stat page already are going to be slightly increased. That's good. The Chimera I think is one of the least performing of the capital ships. And for non-combat ships, Covert Ops added one mid-slot for explorers to increase the success rate of exploration! Yay! They can now actually fit the blue scanner to find the sites, the relics analyzer, and the data analyzer. No longer do you just kind of have to undock and go, right, well, I'm going to go for a relic analyzer, and if I find any data sites, I'm just going to have to ignore them and weep into my pillow. Now you can fit all three relevant modules. Huzzah! I can't believe it's taken until this blasted patch to do that, but I'm just happy it's here. The Venture 4 increased mobility and mining capacity. I would normally be a little bit disappointed that mining capacity is getting increased, not reduced, but it's the Venture 4, and let's be honest, there needs to be an actual reason to, uh, to fly that hunk. 
Then the Coveter increased its mobility. Um, I'm not sure the Coveter needs buffs, but hey, it's just a mobility buff. At least we're not seeing any mining yield increases on the Coveter. And transport uh, ships increased special cargo hold capacity. So if you're using things like the Wreath or the Badger, the Tyra, the Bestower, that kind of thing, you're going to have a bigger special cargo hold after this patch. Structure parts and capital ship components can now be put into the structure hold as well, which means there is actually going to be a reason to fly the Amar transport ships because those things are pretty much useless. Number six then, general weapon balance. Railguns seem a bit weak, don't they? Not sure I agree, but okay, <laughs> it's just a title. As a result of the statistics and considering the original design purpose, we made the following adjustments to weapons to align their features with their intended purpose. The adjustments are mainly for large and extra large weapons, bit of feedback on this one to come in a moment. As a result of the statistics and considering the original design purpose, we made the following adjustments to weapons to align their features with that intended purpose. Large weapons. Beam lasers are getting a reduction to their tracking speed. Good. They did not need to be able to track as well as they were. They are long range turrets in inverted commas. Uh, commas. They do not need the insane amount of tracking that they had for that. They're there. Pulse laser. Increased damage. Again, this I'm hoping is fairly minor, not one I ever thought I would need to see, but if you pilot an Abaddon and you use uh, large pulse lasers, or indeed an Oracle using large pulse lasers, you're going to be doing more damage now, so rejoice. R large rifled railguns get an increase to their tracking speed, good, and cruise missile and torpedoes increase the flight velocity range. Cool. I'm down with that. It means that now the Typhoon, the Raven are going to have longer range. And I know some people are going to complain about the application um, still. Quite frankly, ultimately, the advantage of the Typhoon 2 is that it has inbuilt application. If you're complaining that the Raven can't apply its damage well enough, consider using some of the damage application rigs or indeed the missile navigation computer or whatever it's called in the low slots. It's a, a, a unit I never see used, but it is so freaking powerful. Been using it recently on some ships and actually it is so good. Extra large weapons, extra large rifled railguns get an increased tracking speed and damage, adjusted the range to bring the damage curve in line with its general characteristics. Snub nosed la uh, extra large snub nosed get increased damage, extra large autos get adjusted range to bring the damage curve in line with its general characteristics. Strikes, extra large strikes get reduced damage as strike cannons have the longest range and was able to deal more damage than they should. Yeah, I'm going to be completely frank on that one. The nerf there to the extra large strikes, if you've seen a naggle fire in action, that that does kind of make sense. Cruise missiles and torpedoes increase range, reduced damage, and reload time correspondingly, thus increasing error tolerance. Basically now you're getting slightly reduced damage, but a faster firing rate instead, um, with an increased range across the board there as well. So again, good news there for missile pilots. Um, for people complaining that hang-on cruise missiles and extra-large torpedoes still aren't going to apply their damage to anything smaller than a citadel, congratulations, welcome to the conversation, you've just figured out what dreadnoughts are for. 6.3 Special Weapon Mode Sniper Mode Precision is higher, range is further, but DPS remains low, still following the pr uh, principle of precision over damage. So getting better like hit rate, longer range, um, but just still that lower DPS. It's still all about the damage per shot, not about your overall DPS. Assault mode cannot warp in this mode, mainly used for positional warfare, not hit and run type of operations. Cool, again, kind of makes sense, I guess. Now we move on to section 7, armor and shields, an age old problem. In past updates we've adjusted shields and armor more than once to bring them in line with our expectations. The shield resistance is good while the upper limit is not high, and the high consumption is exchanged for fast recovery. Whereas armor resistance is low while the upper limit is high, and the high capacitor repair conversion rate is exchanged for lasting combat capability. That is the design intent, they're not saying that's how it is, in fact they're saying that's not really how it actually is currently it should be that shield resistance is good um, but will have sort of a lower upper limit with high consumption of capac a capacitor but fast recovery a shield booster should give you a lot of shield back um, quickly but at the expense of a lot of capacitor being chewed whereas armor it should have lower basic resistances but going up higher 
excuse me again, got hiccups here, I got super excited on that damage section, and high capacitor, excuse me, jeez, and the high capacitor rate conversion rate is exchanged for lasting combat capability. So basically, armor should start at lower resistance, increase to higher resistance, be slower to bring up its uh, repair, but be much more capacitor effective. After this adjustment, shields and armor will be more in line with this idea. Shields and armor resistance, currently the strength of adaptive resistance modules is too high, but the growth is not obvious. As the meta level increases, the effect of shield and armor resistance on survivability is attenuated strongly and the resistance benefits of shield and armor of different meta levels vary greatly. Thus, we've adjusted the resistance growth curve. After the adjustment, resistances no longer have a significant reduction in survivability gains, and the resistance gain coefficient for shield armor of all metal levels will remain exactly the same. For example, because that kind of blew my mind when I read it, for example, the resistance of the Dead Space series of modules, blue, will remain the same or increase slightly, but the defense effect will decrease when the meta level is lower. Basically, this means that if you're using C-types, things will be fine, but if you're using sort of Republic Fleet or the lower level ones, you will have a significantly lower resist. And I, I mean, I'm sort of in two minds of that. Considering how easy it is to get the Dead Space modules, how cheap they are on the market in general, I don't think that really actually fixes anything. It kind of makes things the same. And in fact, if they get an in a slight increase to those Dead Space uh, adaptive invulnerability fields, adaptive armor hardeners, that kind of thing, that actually is a buff overall, because I can't remember the last time I fit Republic Fleet um, adaptive invulnerability fields or adaptive armor hardeners to a ship, because there's no point why when you can just spend a few like extra isk to get the C-type. Anyway, I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to see on that one. Shields and armor repairers. At present, small and medium armor repairers outperform shield boosters in terms of both time and efficiency and capture efficiency. This goes against optimal design intention and requires adjustment. This is true. Um, ultimately, small and medium armor repairers outperform the shield boosters in both time efficiency and capacitor efficiency. There's not enough difference between a shield booster and an armor hardener. Um, I actually started armor tanking a lot of my ships recently um, when I spotted this. Enhance the effect of small and medium shield boosters to match their respective characteristics. I'm assuming that's going to be a slight increase to how fast they cycle and increasing the amount of shield that a shield booster can actually give back. I'm all for that. That's good changes we like. Let's move on then to section 8, fitting 8 heat sinks. <laughs> this also is covering things like shield extenders and armor plates, also capacitor batteries, anything that has that activatable mode plus the sort of passive for it being fitted. Now we've all seen some fits that do that whole thing of stacking 8 heat sinks, um, where you just activate all of them and you get massive damage increases just from the passive bonuses, and then you get an even bigger one by activating all of them. We've also seen this recently with shield extenders, where people are using two or three shield extenders instead of shield boosters and actually getting a better effect. I've had some people comment on my videos and say, why, are, why haven't you showcased this? This is why, because I had a sneaky suspicion that that was not intended and it was something that was going to get nerfed in the upcoming patch, and it looks like it is, so let's jump in. The design concept of low slot modules is normally to strengthen itself and can be actively activated in exchange for stronger effects when needed, similar to overheating in EVE Online. However, due to the bonus of skills and the strong bonus of, active, of range of active effects, the active opening of low slot modules has become a common method which goes against our design concept and increases the burden of Capsuleer's operation. For the sake of Capsuleer's and in line with the design concept, we've made the following adjustments. It basically, they've enhanced the passive effect of these modules weakened the active effect and increased the cooldown time. So if you're looking at, for example here, a heatsink and similar modules, the magnetic field stabilizer, ballistic control unit, gyro stabilizer, that kind of thing, it's got an enhanced passive damage bonus. So it's getting additional damage bonus just for having it installed, and they've removed the additional damage bonus on active activation. So when you activate a gyro stabilizer or a heatsink now, it's not going to give you additional damage bonus, but you're gonna have more damage cold. So heated, you're gonna not get a bonus, but you'll have more DPS cold. However, they've enhanced the passive cooldown bonus, reduced the additional cooldown bonus on active activation, and increased the cooldown time. So 
Basically, they've added passive effects to the drone DPS enhanced modules as well. So you're going to have an increase to the effect of the, uh, the the module when it is like cold and sitting there quite you know quite happily just fitted to your ship. When you activate it, you're not going to get as big a boost as you had before. So it's a passive buff and an active nerf, if that makes sense. So with using a heat sink as an example, you're not when you when it's passive when it's just fitted and you're running cold, you're going to have higher DPS than you have currently cold. But when you activate it, it's not going to be such a big buff. You'll still get the activation time adjustment, but you're not getting the additional damage bonus. Augmented armor plates, battery and shield extenders. Temporary shields, temporary armor and temporary capacitors are now too powerful as a temporary emergency option and they completely surpass self-repairing modules as far as duration is concerned. Literally, what I was just talking about regarding like shield extenders and things like that. Um, Nina and I have been talking a lot about the capacitor batteries as well. Um, this is one of those things that not a lot of people talk about, but it is genuinely there. Actually, talking to Zyklon about his fit with... Uh, with, with the rupture as well, he was talking about how ultimately you stay away from anything you know is going to be running shield, like shield, uh, capacitor batteries because they're just impossible to break at that point. That's not a good thing. So anyway, they're supposed to be used as a temporary emergency option and they completely surpass self-repairing modules as far as the duration is concerned. Moreover, the additional effects are added according to proportions and the effects brought about by ships of different tonnage and different characteristics are quite different. So the following adjustments have been made. Basically, if you put a uh, capacitor battery on a bigger capacitor, the capacitor battery does more because it's percentile based. So enhanced the passive armor hit point or shield hit point bonus on extenders. So those are going to get you by having an extender fitted, you will have more EHP than you do cold currently, but enhanced the sh uh, value of armor hit point shield bonus for the active duration and removed the percentage bonus. So you're going to get more cold you know more raw hp but not as good scaling if that makes sense and can you tell i've been playing elden ring this morning reducing the overall effect of active activation so basically it like above the passive shield uh, shield extender or armor plate or bat uh, battery is going to do more when it is just fitted but when you need to activate it that activation isn't going to do as much as it currently does and it's going to have a longer cooldown time between activations the idea is that the passive effect is bigger but you don't get as big an active effect instead so it makes them sort of it, it differentiates more between active tanking and passive tanking Number nine, then, ore compression. You know what I mean. <laughs> yes, we all do. This is what many capsulists have said, speaking of ore compression. You know what we mean. The original intention behind ore compression was to make it easy for capsulists to relocate and facilitate logistics in nullsec. But we don't want this to affect markets in high sec or low sec too much either, so a high compression cost is indeed required. Now, as the demand for minerals increases and as the market convenience has not yet been significantly improved, we decided to increase the effectiveness of the ore compression skill, thereby reducing the cost of ore compression. Now, I'm not sure what they mean here is the demand for minerals increases. We don't really have that much of a demand for minerals. Still, this is the industrial thing. We're going to be seeing changes in May. They've already confirmed that. We decided to increase the effectiveness of the ore compression skill, thereby reducing the cost of ore compression. I think that's a good thing. I think this is one of those systems that not many people use for the simple fact it is just too expensive. So by making it easier to access, more people will use it, and we should be able to therefore have more people actually consuming fuel to use use the ore compression skill so it actually does help us use more fuel as well um it's kind of a swings and roundabouts thing i'm all for this i think that's a good change Number 10, missile damage does not match what is described in the tips. We've received a lot of uh, feedback about the gap between missiles actual damage and what's described in its tips. This happens to some other weapons as well. Simply put, it's not a bug. It was caused by an imbalance between offense and defense, resulting from the non-availability of some weapon skills. Due to the flight velocity bonus now being relatively attainable and high, you can easily rush into your enemies when activating a warp drive. In the meantime, since advanced skills are still not available, attributes countering flight velocity like turret tracking speed and missile explosion velocity can't be improved basically we do, i did a video on this about like do we need more skills do we need more weapon skills we don't have skills that just flat out improve turret tracking speed or missile explosion velocity it would be i kind of think it'd be nice to get those but it says here um 
Ultimately, they don't intend to re uh, release skills for tracking speed and explosion velocity, but at the same time, in order to reduce high operating difficulty caused by a ship's high speed, we reduce the flight velocity bonus of all the ship operation skills. So things like Frigate Command, um, Cruiser Command, Battleship Command now actually have a lower flight velocity bonus, so we are all having our ships slowed down a little bit. And yes, Vetamune, I can hear you sobbing in the background there, and this does possibly mean that your stabber is going to be going below 2,000 kilometers per second without some <laughs> without some changes. Sorry about that. Um, but I kind of get where they're coming from here. They don't want to just buff all of the tracking and explosion velocity. They don't want to put those uh, skills in yet. Uh, go, they're just going to reduce the speed that things move at um, and do things that way. I think that's a good way to combat power creep. I think that nerfing everything rather than trying to buff a few small things to, you know, or add some more complexity, I think that's an interesting way of doing it, and I agree with this. The more I think about this, the more I actually agree with that. It's not a huge reduction, um, but yeah, we'll see. I think that helps. Then we come to number 11, please ban drones from siege battles. Drones are convenient as a weapon system, however due to network and performance optimization issues, if both sides of a siege battle are carrying thousands of drones, it does make it easier for the network to crash. Thank you. How many times have I said this, that one of the big issues between why we didn't used to get so many, um, why we didn't get used to get so many black screens during fights compared to how we do nowadays, or well, actually in fairness, there haven't been really that many complaints about it recently, there have been improved movements, but you know, from the start of the game to the point where that was at its peak, it's because we've been getting so many more drones. Every single ship that is flown in those now has at least one drone, and many, many uh, of the alliances out there use drone doctrine. So you've got ships in being, you know, 100 people flying ships each with five drones. That's 500 drones on the battlefield, just on one side. Considering the game basically counts those drones equally as um, as other ships, that's rather than just 100 ships versus 100 ships, that's actually like 600 versus 600. Um, but you just don't see those numbers in local because they're drones. Anyway, in addition, due to the low cost of medium and small drones and the issue of being targeted and attacked by large ships, it's a very tactful way to use a large number of small and medium drones to conduct hit and run operations against the enemy, which is tricky. As a result, the Concorde led development and authorized the launch of a large anti-drone pulse bomb module, and I am so glad this is not your typical smart bomb. It's kind of like smart bombs, but in a much better way. It's a large scale module specifically designed for the shield system of drones and fighters. This means it does not hit frigates or larger ships. It only applies its damage to drones and fighters. This requires higher energy. It's fitted in the high slot, while large pulse bombs are usually fitted on battleships. When enabled, it can damage all drones and fighters within a certain range of the ship. For small-scale PvP or PvE, there's no need to specifically carry anti-drone pulse bombs. For large-scale battles, however, several professional anti-drone ships will become the new stars of the battlefield. If you still want to use drone tactics, how you protect yourself and destroy enemy anti-drone ships will become an important tactic. I can hear people saying, oh, our PvP drone doctrine's gone away. Well, yes, to a certain degree it has, and that's a way to get stability. By reducing the amount of drones, it allows the game to be more stable. Um, but if you still want to use that, then at least there is now an actual counter to drones. One of the big complaints we've had about electronic warfare is that there's tracking disruptors and there's guidance disruptors, but there's no drone disruptor. This is it. This is it. Basically, it is a large high slot module that is going to just do a pulse around it that will damage any drones or fighters within range. It's not the kind of thing you're going to want to fit to every single ship in your fleet because then you're going to be losing so much DPS, but it is a way to punish drones. And it's not saying, oh, it hits them and it kills them. It just deals damage to them. So I'm all for this. I hate smart bombs in EVE Online with a passion. I just, I think pipe bombing whilst hilarious and funny to watch, it's just such a bull crap tactic that's not much fun for anyone on the receiving end of it. Um, and ultimately, I think that if you're looking at things like the smart bombs anyway, they're just too much of a, just press a button to kill all the frigates. This to me is a really nice balance. It's a way to counter drones without blasting all of the frigates and destroyers out of the game as well. We're in the process of further improving the performance of large battles in several ways, and we'll gradually update it in the future. At present, with the use of anti-drone bombs, a huge number of drones could be tackled to a certain extent, and the fluency of the battle will be improved. I am so happy with that change. I think that is a brilliant way of doing things. 
Finally then, we come to two other updates, Lazarus unit giveaways. When I did my video recently on Lazarus units, I pointed out that I was just confused as to why they existed, that essentially they were the same as just buying the Plex anyway, whether you bought a Lazarus unit with ore or whether you bought just Plex and reskilled that way, it was basically identical, until Jade Zion pointed out to me that, hang on a second, yeah, true, but this is now an item they can give away to people in things like daily login rewards or with balance patches without giving Plex, without giving Plex that can be used in so many unintended ways, they can give you something that is just designed to help you respec. And this is what we've got. Considering that Capsuleers may have Lazarus unit needs after the balance adjustment, we will provide you with Lazarus unit gifts. During the event when the tech level reaches 5, you can receive the Lazarus unit. Basically, if you're lower than tech 4, you don't need to respec. I kind of get that. For higher tech levels, each level will unlock a separate reward that can be claimed. The exact amount is subject to the official event notice. So the higher, level, higher tech level you are, the more Lazarus units you're going to be getting to allow you to respec some of your skills. If you think that some of this stuff up here has ultimately made your ship useless, which I really don't agree with, but I can flip that on the other way around. Maybe it's made a ship that you're not flying because you don't like it. For example, the Blackbird. Um, you don't like its skills, it's underpowered, you want to fly it but you just can't bring yourself to fly something that doesn't work properly, maybe now that it's working you want to reskill into it. Well, you're going to be getting a load of Lazarus units so that you can do so. Then we have corporation management updates. When the corporation leader is offline for more than 21 days, corporation members can initiate a vote to change the CEO. It takes 48 hours, it's a registered ballot, and results will be made public. When the voting is over, the capsule with the highest number of votes will become the new CEO. That is such a cool system. I know so many corporations that have had you know, groups of friends, then the CEO has just vanished, and you basically have to kick everyone out. You've got a corporation now that you can't use the name of, you've got to recreate everything, you lose so much. Now you can boot out the inactive CEO and you can actually take over yourself. That's amazing and I love that. Only corporation members who've joined the corporation and logged into the game within three days before voting starts will be eligible to be vote uh, to vote and can be voted uh, for. Awesome. Again, so it's not abusable. You can't just pump alts in to, you know, vote for yourself. Now, the above is all the content for this balance update. Also, in May, we'll be kicking off our industry month with some brand new industry ships and industry balance updates. So, yay, that is still coming. We're well aware that Capsuleers have a lot of feedback and appeals, but due to limited resources and priorities, we will make the above adjustments at this time. Thank you for your understanding. We will continue to collect your feedback and make changes to provide better gaming experience for all Capsuleers. Check out the discussions by following the community at the usual options. This is amazing. Like, look, I kind of wish there was more going on with Destroyers than there currently is. We've got the industrial changes happening in May, so we can ignore those. But there are so many really good, solid changes here that I am super, super hyped for. I'm going to be, we're going to be losing the whole toxic interceptor meta. We're going to have a reason to fly other frigates. Some of those are getting buffs. Oh, I'm so excited. So excited that the Dramiel is getting buffed. That has been top of my wish list for so long. But anyway, anyway, there is so much stuff in here that I think is really cool. Moving forward into this balance patch, I think there's a lot to be looking forward to here. We know there's going to be a test server, they said around about the 9th, I think it was. Um, 9th of April, there we are, test server on 9th of April, um, that we can all jump into and try all of this out. So that's really exciting too. I can't wait to get in there, get my hands on this, and have some fun with this balance patch. It's, as I said, I wish there were more destroyer changes, but there's another part of me that's looking at the fact that this is just the balance. The way to fix destroyers might be by adding new ships elsewhere. We are getting some destroyer changes in there. There's so much other really cool stuff in here that I'm just super excited for. Stuff that I hadn't even considered, but they've just made it so much better and in some really interesting ways too. Anyway, let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comment section down below. Let me know which change you are most excited for. I think there's so much good coming in this. I don't want to focus on the what's missing or what you don't like. I want to know what you are excited for because I am super hype about this. Like genuinely, I was really worried that this was going to be massively disappointing and I'm actually surprisingly impressed with this. I'm pleased with it. I can't wait to give this a go. Anyway, folks, thank you very much for watching this lengthy verbose video right the way to the end. Happy sailing, and see you in New Eden!